My name is Nenad Bogoric, and I'll be sharing with you how we uh, run and manage Kafka clusters in Kubernetes at Amadeus. And Amadeus is a provider of IT services for travel industry. Uh, so for those of you who came uh, by plane and staying in a hotel, you might use, be using our uh, services without knowing. Uh, we're celebrating 30 years this year, which makes us much younger than our biggest competitor, which is a Texan company. Uh, we have been running Kubernetes since uh, its inception, so since three years, which is basically 30 years equivalent in Kubernetes years, uh, uh, on our own premises and in public clouds. Uh, I'm solution architect at Amadeus. I'm helping our business units either develop new platforms or migrate. In 30 years, we have quite a number of applications. And today's migrations are almost always towards Kubernetes. So we use Kafka, we use Kafka outside Kubernetes, we use Kafka next to Kubernetes. We actually did it since we started using it for logs and for events collection. We have been installing it using Puppet, which is an experience we don't like to repeat. <laughs> uh, and recently we had this idea to start using actually Kafka for more functional stuff and we are building a streaming platform where we have a number of uh, uh, events, uh, operational events from the airlines or uh, things like bookings or uh, boardings, which go into the platform and there's a, a whole number of uh, microservices which process this in the pipeline and then some, some actions executed at the end. And we use Kafka as underlying uh, messaging infrastructure. So uh, this is supposed to be advanced session, so I guess you all know Kafka, but to be on the same page, what is Kafka? It's a streaming platform. Uh, you have a cluster of servers, and servers are called brokers, uh, storing uh, streams of records and topics. Uh, topics are split into partitions, which are spread over all uh, brokers, which allows for horizontal uh, scalability. You can add new brokers and new partitions and ac accept more traffic. You can replicate those partitions to have a high availability. If one broker uh, dies, you have a backup on another. And you have producers and consumers as clients of this uh, uh, platform. Okay, so can we run it in Kubernetes? Well, when you run a normal replica set or you do deployment in Kubernetes, you get something like a pod which is called uh, with a randomish uh, extension at the end, uh, which is not fits well with uh, uh, Kafka. Because in Kafka, in a uh, Kafka cluster, each broker has its own unique identity. Uh, which is both an ID, but it also has to have its own unique network address so that brokers can talk between themselves and also that they can, clients can talk with brokers. They also need persistence to store this uh, partitioned log files. In addition, you, don't, you need another thing next to uh, Kafka cluster. You need a Zookeeper cluster because Kafka stores a lot of metadata inside uh, Zookeeper, uh, which is basically exactly the same thing. You need another cluster with uh, nodes which have identity and persistence. And luckily, we have uh, now stateful sets in uh, Kubernetes. Actually, when we started, those were called uh, pet sets. Uh, they evolved and they will soon be uh, exiting beta. So what is a stateful set? Uh, unlike traditional pods, if we can save something three years old uh, traditional, is uh, stateful uh, uh, set pods have a stable pod identity. So they will be called pod zero, pod one, pod two. They, uh, you also need to create a um, headless service, which is a kind of subdomain within your namespace. So your pod address would be pod zero dot some domain, if it's the name of the service, dot namespace. Or whatever. Uh, they provide stable storage. They provide ordered startup and start down, uh, shutdown. So they will start press zero, then one, then two, and uh, shut down in reverse. And since recently, yeah, there are rolling updates. So to run Kafka and Zookeeper, we need two stateful sets. And actually in Amadeus, when we run Kafka and Zookeeper deployments, we always run one Kafka and one associated Zookeeper. Uh, for those who operate Kafka, you know you can share Zookeepers across men, uh, several clusters. It's not what we're doing in Kubernetes, we're deploying one, one to one. Um, and uh, in addition, uh, there is a discovery service. So unlike 
headless service which doesn't have a cluster IP. The discovery service has a cluster IP and it actually allows clients to just say, okay, I want to connect to Kafka. Uh, you bootstrap them, you don't have to tell them, go to Kafka Zero, you tell them, go to Kafka, and it will f fall on one of the brokers and then learn about full cluster. And of course, if you want to deploy things in Kubernetes, first thing that you need is containers, and you need your descriptors, and then you need probably things like, I want to facilitate this and to replicate and to do several times deployments, so you need things like charts. So there's a number of projects out there on uh, uh, GitHub. I think most are inspired by Yolians, Kubernetes Kafka. Those in bold are the ones which are inspired by what, how we operate inside the Medios. Um, uh, you have a chart and you have uh, the operator object there. So I'll be trying to do a small demo. So I hope the demo gods are on my side today. It worked on plane coming over here. The first thing I will do, I will deploy to uh, a producer and a consumer. And of course, we'll, we'll see, because I haven't deployed Kafka uh, cluster, they will probably fail royally. So they're failing as there's no Kafka there. No, there's not, nothing in the cluster. So let's uh, delete those two. And I'll now deploy cluster. We, uh, at Amadeus, we are actually running uh, OpenShift as uh, a Kubernetes distribution, so we are using OpenShift templates to deploy. Here I'll be using Helm charts. Uh, Helm is a package manager for Kubernetes, and it's a great way to reproduce uh, your deployments or to have multiple deployments if you want uh, in an environment. So I will here deploy my Kafka cluster. It should take just a few seconds, and we'll see what, uh, how will uh, deploy all the elements necessary, so several stateful sets and services that are needed. So let's have a look. First, we have our stateful sets up there, uh, two of them, Kafka and Zookeeper. I uh, uh, requested three uh, of each, and we have our services that I was mentioning just before. We have a headless services with no IP, uh, no cluster IP, and we have um, uh, cluster IP services for, uh, for the discovery. There are a few other things that are deployed here, but I will talk about those uh, uh, later. So while it uh, uh, spins them up, i just share a few of the practices we use actually in uh, Amadeus when deploying Kafka. Um, Kafka is pretty much disk I.O. and network uh, uh, performance of the Kafka is disk I.O. network uh, based. So we will actually want to land Kafka brokers on the instances which have good performance disk-wise. So basically it means SSD. And we use node selectors for this. For all the brokers have node selectors that want to deploy them on the nodes which has, have a label disk fast or something similar. But there we also want to do something is that we don't want that all our Kafka brokers land on the same node with this uh, a label, because if we lose that node, then we lose all of the cl cluster. So we are using uh, anti-affinity, which is a feature in Kubernetes, which allows us to tell, uh, take this uh, pod, which have this specific uh, uh, label, and spread them across some topology key. And um, here we are using a host name key. So we, we are saying basically to Kubernetes, when you deploy these Kafka brokers, please make them across different uh, uh, machines. Uh, we are using preferred. You can also uh, enforce it. You can say it has to be on different machines. Another thing which is necessary for Kafka is uh, persistent uh, storage. Um, when you're using stateful set, you can use uh, a volume, um, uh, volume claim templates where actually you specify a kind of uh, volume claim you want and each pod would get exactly the same uh, volume claim type, so you have six pods, you will have six different volume uh, claims. And for those of you who were reading the slides instead of listening to me, it's written things there are completely different. Because that's a common wisdom. When you're running Kafka, you want to keep your uh, logs. You want to get persistent volumes. You get, uh, it's provisioned, it's attached to your pod, it's stored. Your pod dies, you will get it back again. Uh, in our particular case, we are building a streaming platform which has pretty strict SLAs. From the moment that an event comes inside, 
uh, it should be, uh, all the action should be taken within a few seconds, uh, m most f a few minutes. So we can keep the amount of data fairly lim limited on the, the brokers, and we want this high performance. So we could use host, uh, um, uh, host path, but that's not good security-wise. So what we actually do is we, uh, for each of the pod in a pod set, we simply say, okay, use empty volume. It will be a local disk. It will be an SSD. It will be fairly fast. Uh, if the container crashes, we get actually the same empty there, and all's fine. If the node crashes, well, we lose it. But we are running Kafka, and one of the selling points of Kafka is this replication. You have a copy of your uh, um, partitions replicated, so when a, a pod is spun up on a different node, eventually it will get up to date in sync with uh, the current leaders, and it will uh, be able to serve it. Of course, to be able to do it, you have to have enough uh, brokers and you have enough replicas. So if you have five bro uh, broker cluster and two replicas, well, you can afford to lose one uh, of the brokers. Um, well, if you have two replicas, you can only afford to lose one uh, brokers. If you lose two, you, you might will be in trouble. Uh, what's coming soon in uh, uh, Kubernetes, it's actually in alpha already, is local persistent volumes, which would be volumes which are on a local machine, and the pod would then be only scheduled on this particular machine. It's something that we'll be looking into future. Uh, in future, uh, honestly, currently, uh, behavior with the MTDR was sufficient for our uh, use cases. You have to monitor what's going on. You won't have to see. There are Several approaches to monitor Kafka. You can see those also in GitHub. You may use Kafka scripts. What we actually do in Amedeo is we uh, use uh, TCP socket. We actually, we open uh, the sockets on the Kafka brokers because that's what's telling us it's running. Uh, it's accepting connections. And we use Prometheus and JMX. Uh, we are uh, we're repackaging ourselves uh, containers, so basically we are deriving from what has been done in Fabricate project, which for everything which is JVM automatically exposes uh, Prometheus and JMX entry points. So we can have a nice dashboards, and if the operators need to do something, they can go directly and connect to the pod and look into the uh, JMX. Uh, for diving into operators, let's have continue with our demo part. So. Okay, have a little bit of trouble here. Let's deploy again our consumer and producer. Let's see what happens there. Oh, it's not working. So, uh, well, actually, it's connected. It's no longer a big exception, Java exception we see there. Uh, uh, it's connected, but uh, we are running in a multi tenant environment. So, we have uh, microservices which are published there. So, we have dozen of teams we're publishing those independently and uh, we want actually to control who connects to the which cluster we don't want it okay you go there you just type kafka 1992 and you're connected to the cluster and you start publishing we want to use uh, uh, to authentify uh, uh, clients and we are uh, actually before i have installed as it's our process we create a separate secrets and there are secrets published for each of the kafka uh, clusters which allow clients to connect, so there's a JAS file inside it. Uh, so let's do it. Let's deploy the secured version. It has to spin up. Eventually it will, hopefully. Yes, it's there and it's not running. It's still failing, but it's a different error. Uh, it's failing with an uh, unknown topic. Because uh, if you want to run things with Kafka, you need to create topics. And there are two ways, basically, how you do it. You can do it uh, by saying, okay, anyone can create the topics, which basically leads to chaotic thing there. You have hundreds of topics. Or you may use uh, Kafka, scripting, uh, Kafka um, scripts to do it. So either there is a person who is typing, or you have Ansible, or whatever uh, tooling you use to create those topics. Which brings us to the subject of the operators. So what are the operators? So it's a pattern uh, of trans 
posing the domain knowledge of SRE operations or releasing teams into executable code to automate uh, behavior uh, based on some kind of descriptors. You describe what you want to have, and the tooling will do it for you. And I mean, those are actually level operators. We use a couple of those. There is open source Prometheus operators they use. The blue ones are actually the ones that we have written, and some are open sourced already, workflow, and some will be uh, like Redis cluster. Um, and one of the first things that operators do is they provision uh, clusters. That's what Prometheus, for example, does, or that's what, that's what our Redis cluster operator does, among other uh, uh, things. Uh, and as you see, I can actually fairly easily provision cl clusters using op uh, hand charts or OpenShift templates or apps we saw uh, today at Keynotes. Uh, and once the platform is up and once Kafka is running, up, for us it stays in place. It will be there for a fairly long amount of time. We can scale it up if there's a problem, and that's usually what we need when we scale up. Uh, Scaling down and evacuation, if you have to do upgrades of the nodes and upgrades are tricky. Some of these things work because of the Kafka replications. I'll talk about that a little bit at the end. But we have this question of topics. As we're deploying dozens of microservices, we need dozens and even more uh, of topics being created. And for us, we want to have the topics present in target environments when we deploy microservices so we can start immediately running. We want to delete them if uh, a microservice is not there, because particularly they can be rearranged and, uh, for, for different customers. Want to have the same behavior in environments, in development, in QA, in production, but also across different production clusters, as we may have clusters running on our premises or in the public cloud. Uh, we want to be able to react on things like, okay, this node is no longer having disk space. Let's reduce redemption time uh, for, for Kafka, and uh, we all actually want to deliver all this as a code. So when developers actually finish their coding, they do their pull request, there's a container built. We actually, from their description of their uh, project, generate deployment uh, YAML file and generate this descriptor of the topic, which then goes in Kubernetes. And then there is a process in Kubernetes, Kafka operator, which looks into it and applies it. So how does it look a uh, topic as a go? Well, it's a config map for us. Uh, it might be soon a custom resource. Uh, it's a config map which basically says, I want a topic like this name, which is the name of the config map, with a partition count, with a replication factor like this, and maybe someone knew what, how to configure more into details the properties. And whenever this config map is created in, uh, in Kubernetes, the operator that's managing a cluster will create a topic for it. And whenever a config map is deleted, it will delete it. And it's actually exactly the same behavior as service catalog provision, unprovision uh, behavior. We intentionally mapped it because we are going towards offering internally uh, uh, IT services as a service catalog. So let's do it. Let's uh, create this. Config map, so it's there. And let's have a look at what's going on here. So we'll have a long list here. Oh, and it's working. So uh, as soon as the uh, config map was there, topic was created and the publisher started working and the uh, consumer started consuming. I can just show you what happened inside the operator. So uh, inside the, the operator, there, there is a log which basically says, okay, I've seen that you have the, the config map and I've created a topic for this config map. So that's fine, that allows us to manage uh, all the topics, but I want actually to go a step further there, uh, I'm a little bit conscious about security. We want to control the access uh, to the topics. Um, we don't want that if a developer hard-coded the topic name in the code, that suddenly the uh, microservice which is deployed starts publishing to a topic which shouldn't be uh, there. So we are actually using access control where we have um, each deployment comes with a notation saying, okay, listen, I'm consuming this topic and I'm publishing to this topic. It can be uh, multiple, uh, actually. And what the, uh, what the um, operator does, it monitors this 
uh, this um, uh, uh, deployment and will actually apply, uh, will actually choose first one uh, random user, assign it to this uh, deployment, create a secret and assign the uh, rights into Kafka uh, to use it. So let's do this part of the demo. Deploying here the ACL. And if we look at the operator logs, we would immediately see that operator has uh, seen that uh, uh, there's a new deployment there called Kafka producer and has assigned a user for it. And they did the same thing for the Kafka consumer, a bit lower, and assigned a user for it. And if you look at the secrets, secrets, actually see that we now have uh, credentials created for our producer and somewhere there should be like here, should be credentials uh, created for, all, for the consumers. And those credentials contain users which in this particular case for a consumer you can only read from one topic and uh, a producer can only publish to uh, one topic. The previous, use, previous case where we did the credentials it's, it, was, uh, it could publish to anything. Um, okay. I'm a little bit ahead of the time, so it's good. Kafka upgrades. Um, it's a thing that we wanted to build since the inception inside um, uh, Kafka operator. Uh, during our work on this, I think there were like three or four uh, changes in Kafka that had to do upgrades. And basically, each of them had a little bit different scenario, which is like not really looking like something that's easily, uh, uh, can be easily automatized. Uh, so for example, if they change into broker protocol, you might need first, when you upgrade, to use the old protocol. So you roll out one upgrade, then you change, do the configuration change, then roll the second uh, uh, upgrade. But maybe the, the Kafka changed storage format. Hopefully now they are one zero, so those things will happen uh, less. And you change uh, uh, storage format, so you might have to first to update the consumers, then go uh, on, on the servers. I had this idea, it's like, don't upgrade, uh, but instead recreate cluster. So basically, it means we have one cluster running, the old version, we create a new cluster with a new version, they're running next to each other. Uh, we can publish actually to, bo do, uh, to both uh, clusters, and then we switch, it's kind of blue-green de deployment. It comes with its own set of problems, which is, I actually wouldn't suggest that anymore. We're more looking into automatizing that in, in the future, finding a way how we can do this, the first step, uh, simply. And uh, performance. Uh, as I said, Kafka performance is basically dominated by disk uh, I.O. That's what uh, we have experienced, and having a good disk, we are opting for SSD, but having a good disk, even if you have network storage, maybe it will work if you have good network storage. Uh, then the second is by network, uh, and it's almost never by uh, CPU or by uh, uh, memory. Uh, we're fa fairly low, even for throughputs like 100, K messages per second, we have issues. There's a couple of things which uh, uh, appear strange when doing testing. So some, uh, sometimes Kafka brokers and Zook, uh, a broker and a Zookeeper land on the same node. So it actually reduces quite a lot network uh, through, uh, through there because they are talking to themselves uh, on the same node. Sometimes like, actually when clients land on the same node, uh, so you might see that you ha have like uh, uh, 20 instances of a, uh, of a microservice pod and then uh, two of them are having this super high performance and all the others are behind the same. So they landed actually on the same uh, node as, um, as Kafka brokers and they're talking um, between themselves. Things to be ready in a cloud environment. It's not everything behaves always the same. And I think that would be it for uh, for the presentation, if you have any questions, feel free to ask.
Can you repeat? Hello. So is your Kafka cluster zone aware, or how are you handling HA? Okay, uh, so uh, uh, we are, our, our clusters are uh, spread, uh, uh, so our Kubernetes clusters are spread across uh, um, our, our, uh, our infrastructure, and uh, we basically rely on the fact that they are, they're not zone aware, we rely simply on the fact that uh, they will be split across different zones in our data center, but uh, not we don't make them aware of the zone. They're not there's nothing like rack aware or things like that. Yeah. So it's technically not HA. We have our uh, we operate our own data data center, and we deploy to other clouds, but we operate our own data center. Mm -hmm. Okay, you can say it. I repeat. Do you have any constraints for the amount of volumes we create per node? Okay, the question was do we have any constraints on number of persistent volume we create per node? Uh, as I said, when we run Ka Kafka, we are running them with empty there, so we don't create persistent volumes. Uh, we are not using much persistent volumes at the uh, moment. We use for some of the monitoring tool. Uh, we used it for the Kafka, uh, but, and, but it didn't put in place any specific uh, constraints there. Okay. In the upgrade process, how do you handle the operator upgrade? Like, is that coupled then with the Kafka cluster okay. upgrade, or is it a separate thing? That uh, the question was, how do we handle a Kafka operator um, uh, upgrades. Well, it's, Kafka operator is completely stateless, so it's actually upgraded out of the band. Uh, it can be updated at any moment in the time, and actually all the updates it does, it does is by delta. It's like Kubernetes. It checks what is the Kafka cluster, what do I have in Kubernetes, and applies the delta. Yes. Yes, it's watching changes on uh, Kafka. The question was, does Kafka operator listen to the changes on a Kafka map? Do you provide for a way to get to Kafka from outside the cluster? Uh, to access, sorry, the question is, do we provide a way to uh, get to Kafka from outside the cluster? Meaning clients are outside of the cluster? No. Okay. <laughs> uh, <let's, yeah. laughs> if someone has the solution for that, we, we are very interested in <laughs> Okay. <laughs> The question was, did we write the operator with the Java client for the Kubernetes? Uh, with the Java client for the Kubernetes and Java client for the new Java client for the Kafka admin client. Uh, question here. Uh, can you repeat or? Uh, So Confluent suggested to run Kafka cluster on bare metal yeah. for p performance reason. What mm -hmm. do you think about that? Okay. Uh, um, our approach is that we tend to run as much as possible things in VMs. And then let's run it on K Kubernetes. Uh, maybe we'll be running Kubernetes on bare metal. Uh, but currently we are running on, the, on the v uh, VMs. Uh, we had the same, exactly the same suggestion from Confluent to run it on bare metal. But we went for VMs. I think there is an error, yeah. Uh, it's needed for a state, uh, the question was uh, why is headless service is needed? It's needed for stateful set. It's by design, that's how stateful set behaves. You need to provide the headless service and then the pods will be in a, with the DNS name, which is pod name state uh, headless service. Then the, I think I had one question here, yeah. Can you share some, some detail, details how big is your Kafka cluster? Our, in this platform, our typical uh, cluster would be uh, five brokers. Uh, we have uh, bigger ones, but I'm not sure I can share this uh, <laughs> information. Okay. If you can either come or because I really. 
the order of deployment is that the queue keeper has to come up and running before you deploy your yeah. uh, things. Like, uh, we don't enforce order of deployment. We actually, uh, I don't think I put uh, uh, get pod. Uh, let's, let's do j just that. Cube CTL get. We're actually seeing that the Kafka uh, zero restarted once. I was restarting because it's waiting. It was it said there's no zookeeper, and it, uh, it crashed and restarted uh, again. So you are you are asking the Kafka to crash yeah. and recover, and restart, so the, so restart until the zookeeper is up and and running. Yeah. Okay. Uh, Can you just speak into the mic, please? Uh, you put the link up of your GitHub operator. Yeah. Uh, do you have any other custom code that you use to run it, or is that kind of the uh, everything that is needed? No, it's not what we run inside house. If that was your question. <laughs> Would you be able to describe any of the, the customizations that you had to do? We have a few customizations around security, uh, mostly, which are inside. It's pretty much a similar thing. Uh, also, we are less up to date with the recent version of Kubernetes and OpenShift inside house compared to this one. So you don't see any restrictions on running the published version? Uh, in uh, so there's the, uh, um, actually we are in talks with some open uh, source uh, uh, players that to make this really open source, well, if it doesn't get anything, we will be open sourcing it uh, uh, from a Medio side. But and if there is to be a community, we think there should be someone who is more into this kind of thing. Wonderful. Let's talk. <laughs> yeah. What kind of storage do you use on public cloud? Sorry? Can you just uh, repeat it? Uh, what kind of storage do you use when you run it on public cloud? Um, so we don't run, uh, uh, as I said, we don't run this with persistence uh, uh, volume uh, at the public cloud. We use instances we ha which have SSDs. Even on public cloud, you yes. mean? Oh. Can you describe your general strategy for scaling down? <laughs> no scaling down. <laughs> um, uh, general strategy to scaling down would be a lot of manual work by moving. Uh, partitions and replicas and then scaling down. And one of the things is that usually, it's just, this may be linked to, usually most of the problems that we experienced were due to the humans, so when the humans scaled it down without taking steps that they have to do before. So it will be really great if that can be uh, automatized. Yeah. Yeah, questions? Uh, well, thank you very much. I hope you have a nice... <laughs>